Yitro. The parasha. I'd say the next, uh, like, 15 chapters is really like the... Um, the crux of who we are and why we are who we are, right? Next 15 chapters of the scriptures. So you, you, this parasha is only 18 through 20, but take it all the way through chapter 32. Um, and, you know, there's some there's significant things happening at this point in time. And, you know, Moses... Moses does what he's commanded to do by taking the children out of Egypt and he's now stuck with this job I don't know if he really understood what he was doing when God said go into Egypt and, and let my people go right go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh let my people go I'm not sure he understood the ramifications of that statement that he now would have ruling authority over three million people and he'd have to create a government and you know build a society and <clears throat> so here in this parasha they get, they get out of Egypt and uh, they're kind of free they're in the desert they come out of Rephidim and Yitro decides to bring Moses' wife and his sons to where they are and he comes to them and he and it says Moses tells them all the great things that had happened all the miracles that God had done and he said truly this is the one true God you throw believed now in the one true God truly he is the almighty the all-powerful God but you know interestingly Jethro intuitively understood now the position that Moses was in um, he said, listen, you know, what have you been doing? And Moses like, well, I, I kind of just, I sit here all day and people come to me with problems and, come, and, and I try to solve them. And it, it's just Moses doing that. And Jethro looks at him and says, are you crazy? Like, you can't do this. This isn't going to work, man. You're going to have to live, you're going to have to change this immediately because you've built you a society you have a you have an entire society that you have to manage so you need to appoint leaders over thousands leaders over hundreds leaders over tens and it's interesting there the requirement of these leaders there's a singular requirement that Jethro says one requirement that they're not covetous These men must not be covetous. Now, there's a reason for that, because they, <clears throat> they're just executing the rules of the society. They can't want authority. They can't want uh, power. They can't want greatness. Isn't it interesting? It's the opposite in society today. The leaders want power, authority, greatness. Jethro says the leaders of your society cannot want power, authority, and greatness. Covetousness is the root of that. If you didn't realize, to covet means that you desire something that someone else may have or that the world may have for you that you haven't achieved. So Jethro intuitively says you must have men that are willing to submit to what is necessary. Not men that are wanting to change and have power and grow and expand their tents and build a kingdom. These men must submit to what is necessary. He, in essence, says you need to have servants leading this flock. And 
Moses himself is said to be the most the humblest man in this world, the humblest man as ever that existed. And uh, he himself did not covet. And interestingly, this is prior to this is prior to the giving of the law. So these men were sitting down, and, and I don't think we've really kind of put this into perspective um, until I, I just didn't think about it until uh, this week. That you know they just come out of Egypt and Rephidim, and Moses here by himself, trying to lead the people, trying to establish a way of life, trying to establish some rules. Um, then he's, Jethro comes along and he tells him exactly what he should do. He's like, yeah, that takes a lot of pressure off me. But now Moses has to lead those men. So those men, it says that, that the hard issues, it says the, the scriptures say the hard issues they would bring to Moses, okay, the ones they couldn't handle. So Moses is creating laws. Okay, he's creating a governing body of laws. And I thought it was interesting that the law had not, the commandments have not come yet. So God must have seen what Moses was dealing with and decided to establish the laws for him. It must have been that God said, well, Moses can't do this alone. Let me tell Moses what I need him to do. Let me tell Moses what I require of him. Because this is what's interesting. In this parasha, God says, I will make you a holy nation, a priest to the world. Nation of priests to the world. So it's in essence, if Moses is creating the laws, if Moses is establishing the governing society, then it's Moses' rules that they're following. But God needs these people for a purpose. This, their life is not purposed for themselves. That's a hard thing to reconcile, that you're not living for yourself I think like that all the time like I just want to live for myself right I mean every you know I don't want to have rules I want to be able to do what I want I mean who doesn't think that they want you know somebody overlording over them watching their every move right leave me alone type environment these people had no choice. They, they, they didn't have the opportunity to do that. They were actually brought out for a purpose, this entire nation. All of the Jewish people are supposed to be the priests to the nations. That's the role of the, the, the people in the society, in the larger, broader society of the, United, of the world, not the United States alone, but of the world throughout all of history. <clears throat> So Moses had to bring, Moses had to receive from God what he required of this people that he chose. And it's unfortunate for these people because they, they didn't choose it. They were chosen. And they were chosen because they were from the loins of Avraham. And it's like, do you choose who you were birthed from? Do you, did you choose your parents? No, none of us did. None of us chose our parents. Chose our parents. I sound like my children. We didn't choose our parents. None of, none of us chose the position in life that we, that we had. You know, we, we talk about, I was talking this, this week about, you know, some people that, the have the haves and the have nots. Those that have and those that have not. Did you choose to have? Or did you choose to have not? Some people, like for instance, to you know, people that run businesses. Some people literally are not smart enough to run a business. They literally couldn't do it if they tried. They could not they couldn't do it. 
So it's not as if they didn't have the opportunity. Even if they had the opportunity, it would fail. And that's not me being harsh. That's just me being real. I mean, that's the reality. It's just not going to work. And the reason is they may not be smart enough. They may not have the mental capacity to be able to do it. They may not be good at math. They may not be able to be good at accounting or balancing a checkbook or whatever because they don't know how to handle that part in life. Did they choose that or was it given to them? And it sounds wicked. It sounds evil. It sounds like, well, why would somebody make someone stupid? Why would you be born without the ability to function normally in society? We don't understand why people get what they get or why they have what they have. We can't comprehend it. We don't know. And we won't know until the day we stand before God. And you know, you probably ask yourself the question all the time, looking at yourself in the mirror. Why don't I have X, God? Why do I think this way, Lord? Why do I live my life like this? Why didn't I have this experience or that one? Why, do, why am I not what I wanted or what I think I wanted? The question is, did you choose or not? And I don't think we choose. For some people, they look back and they go, well, that's harsh because, you know, if this is a destiny, my destiny has been terrible, you know? They look at their life and say, look at my terrible destiny. No, oh, the problem is that I think it's God's plan. For whatever reason, it's God's plan. And if we can't think that way, then we'll fail. I was reading an article because of the, com the commandments. There's art I was reading articles on different commentaries of different rabbis about the commandments. And there's this article on... Uh, on marriage. And the, the, rabbi, the, the rabbi says, because discussing, it related directly to the, the sin of adultery. The rabbi says that you can't, you, you, God intends for you to stay married to be married. You cannot, you cannot divorce, it's God's plan. And the reason being is that but you can divorce, and that's the interesting thing, and that's the caveat. You can, but you can't in Judaism. In Judaism, you can, but you can't. And you can't because it's God's plan. And you can because God, God gives you an out, but he only gives you an out because he, he needs to work through you. But when he works through you, you better do his plan when you're done. So it, the, the, the circle of it was... It, it was interesting how the rabbis were looking at it because the rabbis think very circular and it was weird but it connected God being married to us and helping us understand but the purpose was it's God's plan and some people are upset with their families and their family lives it's God's plan your children were God's plan your life was God's plan it's embedded in the commandments when you destroy that you ruin God's plan and we may not even know what that plan is. We may not even understand or know what he's wanting or trying to do in the future. You have to walk out every single day looking for what he's trying to do. And the question is, you know, you come to the end of, you know, so people come to the sunset of their lives. And they say, look back on their lives and say, what have I done? And they have to, you have to say, well, where did God move, whether small or large, in my life? Who did I touch, whether small or large, in my life? And sometimes, you know, it's like an artist. A famous artist is never famous until he's gone. You, know, you may never know who you touched. You may never know what, who you changed in your life. You may never know your marriage, how it touched somebody's life. You may never know any of that until after, you know, you're gone and then you're looking down on it and saying, whoa, well, I didn't know I, that they liked me the way they did. 
You don't know what happens. And so this parasha is an interesting one because these men and women are chosen, selected. They didn't choose to be who they were supposed to be. And then God provides them with this parasha. He provides them with this, this experience at Har Sinai in chapter 20 where he appears in a theophany. And Moses tells him, don't let the people leave. Don't let the people go out. Don't let the people come near me. Only you and Aaron come up to me and I'll give you the commandments and there's going to be an experience here. But they're going to be frightened. And we've talked many times about the experience of Har Sinai. Right? About what, when the commandment came, they died and then they were revived and then they died. The idea, the concept, and you know, the, 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 the point that when this commandment comes, you know, even as Paul says, that when the commandment came, I died and then I was alive. I, again, when the commandment comes, you die because you realize you're not capable of being who you want to be when you want to be it. It's like when a child wants to, you know, my kids would be in the kitchen cupboards all day long. All day long they'd be in the cupboards picking food out. You know? If you just said, have free reign to the kitchen in the cupboards, it would be all day animals with straws. You know? Then go and get some cookies out of the cupboard. Then, you know what, I think I want some chips and salsa. You know? Eliana, how about you make us fried bologna sandwiches? I mean, it would be all day long them just eating in the kitchen, but there's rules and you can't do it. And those rules are set. You can't choose to do whatever you want to do because you're chosen for something else. And that's a, that's a hard thing to reconcile as a human being, as a, as a, of a person of flesh. That's really the conversation you're going to have at the end of the, your life. I chose you to be this person. Did you do it? That's the conversation. That's it. There's no other conversation. It's that simple. If you didn't do it, is it because your heart wasn't right? Or because you just couldn't overcome your wicked flesh? If your heart wasn't right, you're going to go in a different direction. God has to see that your heart is right. The heart of man is right. And his grace is sufficient for the man who has a right heart and a right spirit. We dress today the, the parasha, the beginning and the starting events of Har Sinai, the, the beginning of an experience that the children of Israel are going to have for the rest of their lives and that we're going to have forever and and our children will have and our children's children will have as a result of their experience we now have experienced God in a, in a way through their story and through their message that no one in the history of time has experienced God if you believe in the writings and we do So here they are, they're freed from this chains, they're freed from Egypt, and he's taking them to this remote desert. He provides them the laws, their instructions that they need to follow in this new world that Moses brought them to. And it wasn't Moses creating the laws, it wasn't Moses that brought them out of the hand of Egypt. God said, it was me who protected you, it was me who brought you out of Egypt, and it's me who will give you instruction. You will follow me. And it's important to note that God needed to provide them these instructions. He had to establish order quickly. I think that already in the beginning, already Moses is getting bombarded with problems. Already Moses is getting bombarded with issues. You imagine three million people coming out of Egypt into a desert, crossing the sea, running from the Egyptians, all kinds of, you know, bilbo, confusion and craziness all kinds of stuff going on 
Everyone had questions. Everyone was wanting to know, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Who, where, how are we going to eat? What, what's our family's going to do? What am I going to do with my children? My cattle are going to starve out here. There's no, there's no food for them to eat. We're in a desert. What are we going to do? I mean, imagine that. What a disaster. No wonder they want to go back to Egypt. There's water from the Nile. There's meat in abundance. Quail, beef, whatever you want. No wonder they, they, didn't, they didn't really have it that bad as slaves in Egypt. They were just worker bees that got their backs lashed if they didn't follow the rules. And tell me which one of you in this society today doesn't get your back lashed if you don't follow the rules. We're all slaves. It's similar. It's probably a similar environment. And in fact, when somebody's a slave owner, you got to make sure your slaves stay healthy so that you can continue to work them. So caring for them is important. That's what we do at businesses every day. Let's make sure they have the right amount of benefits. Let's make sure that they're comfortable at home. Do they have the right salary fitting for their job? You know, and if but then we're the other side. If you don't follow our rules, you're fired, right? That's a backlash. It's the same thing. These people left Egypt and they thought to themselves, we didn't have it that bad. Yeah, I didn't like my job. I woke up every morning and I thought to myself, this is terrible. I have to go and carry bricks up a, a steep, you know, hill and build buildings and do this and do that and I don't want to do it anymore I'm done with it. I'm tired of it I need a new experience but they get out into Egypt they get out of Egypt and now they're in this place and God has to establish order because quickly very quickly it's turning into a disaster they're turning into chaos and confusion without him without God's immediate direction and it's our nature to follow our lusts without having the direction and the command of the king. It's our nature to follow our lusts. That's what, that's what human beings do. It's what happened from the very beginning in the garden. It's your nature. So order must be established, and we have to realize that through the giving of the Ten Commandments, there was order established. And then the additional commands that came, through, through Leviticus and other, and other portions throughout Deuteronomy and other places, you see the other commands that come alongside those ten commands which govern all of society, right? And then there's all the other little commands that govern pieces of society. So I have commands if you're a king, there's commands if you're a prince, there's commands if you're a woman, there's commands if you're a man. There's about 613 of these commands that we call mitzvot, and those mitzvot apply to you or don't apply to you. There's very positive commandments, and then there's very negative commandments, and they're kind of split down the middle, but kind of not. But you have positive and negatives, and you have, you know, any command, do I have to follow this? You know, the church will say, well, you're under the law, not under the grace. You have to follow the commands of God. I can literally tell you that there's commands to women that I do not have to follow. I'm not a woman. I don't follow all the laws because all the laws don't pertain to me. Just like, just like us in this society, right? All the laws don't pertain to us necessarily. Some laws pertain to to adolescents, to juveniles. I'm not a juvenile. Those laws don't apply to me. Other laws that pertain to people that are felons or pertain to people that have had certain levels of misdemeanors, right? So th those things don't apply to us. It's the same thing about society, but we want to do what we want to do because we follow our own lusts. And the story, this whole story from about 15 chapters it's about that it's about seeing things different it's about seeing what God has done for us and then how we blatantly turn from that we blatantly do it 
giving, with the giving of the commands, we realize there's a paradox in man. We fail to wait on God because we want to follow our own lust. If God, if God says to wait on me, we fail to wait on him. We say to ourselves, well, well what am I going to do? I'm going to stand around here and wait? Continue to stand around here and wait when I know all I have to do is go do that and I follow my own lust. Man fails to wait on God. The people of Israel failed to wait on God. His own priests, the people he chose to be his priests. It doesn't make sense. At Har Sinai, God had to repeat himself to Moses. He provided the commandments twice. He didn't com provide the commandments once. He had to provide them twice. The first set of commandments, what happened to them? They were destroyed. Moses literally took the commandments that God made and destroyed them. They were holy, these tablets, touched by the finger of God Himself. And He shattered them on the rocks. What planet are we on? Like, you, you think to yourself right now, I could never do that. Moses who spoke to God face to face, stood in the presence of God face to face, did not have enough fear of Him to not break the tablets that He just put His finger on. Growing up, if I would take what my dad just spent very meticulous time on, working, and I took what he did and threw it on the ground and broke it, I would have gotten my butt beat. I never would have done it out of fear of my father. Moses, who had a direct relationship, intimately stood in front of God himself, met him, spoke to him, had conversation with him, had no fear but to take those tablets and break them on the ground. It's unbelievable. Let's fast forward a few thousand years. The twelve disciples. Walking with Yeshua, the Messiah Himself, God in the flesh. Walking with Him, talking to Him, relationship, hugging Him, holding Him, kissing Him, my brother, blah, 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 all the stuff. Deny Him three times. Look to him in the face, flat out lie to him. How is it that we as human beings, we as flesh, can stand in the very midst and presence of God, God himself, have a personal relationship and a conversation with him, and at the same time, go against what he has to say to us? How is it that we can do it? You know how? Because he's so loving. He's so caring, he's so great and big and sufficient that we take him for granted. Moses took his relationship with God for granted. And God let him do it. It's crazy to think about. Sure, let us do it. We are interesting people. Let's take a look into the situation and see if we can get some more insight. Exodus chapter 32. I'm in, I've taken us four parshas later. Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in, the, were in his hands. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writings was the writing of God, graven on tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said, Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery. 
Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mountain. Like, he didn't even think. I mean, I get angry. I get angry, okay? I get, and and I'll, I'll have my phone in my hand, and I'll go, yeah, to throw my phone, and I think to myself, this is $700 before I throw it. And I'll go, ah! Ah! and then I'll, I'll hit the wall with my hand or something. There's value here. Moses, for whatever reason, didn't think there was value to the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own finger. He didn't value them. They meant nothing to him. It's interesting what God does, and, and we're going to see that, to teach us a lesson. It's interesting that God understood that he didn't value them and he taught him how to value them and we'll learn how he taught us how to do that here in a second but the point is that this is human nature we do not value what God does for us for free when God does something for free for us when God gives us blessings for free for nothing we don't value it He took the calf which they made, he burned it in fire, he ground it into powder, he strawed it upon the water, made the children of Israel drink it. Great. The indignation that he had was so great that he made them do this disgusting thing. Okay? Now, that shows his heart is right. It shows that he's a little bit naive by breaking what God had done, the handiwork of God himself. But it shows that his heart is in the proper place, what he's trying to do. He just has an anger problem. We all know that Moses had an anger problem. He killed the Egyptian before he left Egypt. Then he comes out into Egypt himself. He gets mad at God. Then he goes into Pharaoh and he does all these things. He comes back out. He gets angry at the children of Israel. He grounds a calf of gold into powder, puts it in water, and makes them drink it. That's called torture. He would have been a great CIA agent. He's, that's waterboarding before waterboarding was. So then he gets angry again. He strikes the rock. He doesn't speak to the rock. He's mad. And his anger keeps him out of the gates of, of Israel itself. However, his in, God's intended plan was never that he go to Israel. We all want to make a lesson. Look what anger will do to you. It will keep you out of the gates of heaven. No. God didn't intend that Moses go through into Israel. That wasn't the goal. The goal was that Moses get them through the desert and let Joshua control them in Israel. They had to learn, be guided, be molded and shaped in the desert. And Moses was the man that had the shoulders wide enough, broad enough, and strong enough to deal with the problems of the desert. And Joshua was the new visionary for what God would do in the land of, Egypt, in the land of Israel. It's so blatantly clear now, as you think through life, that that's what was going on. So Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do? What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not anger of the Lord wax hot. He said, Chill out. Moses, relax. Thou knowest the people that they're set on mischief. For they said to me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as, the ma for, as, for as for this Moses, the man has brought us up out of the land of Egypt, and we want not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath gold, let him break it off. This dude Aaron was a man pleaser and a weakling at this point in time. Now Aaron was the high priest, and he was the brother of Moses, and he was a pretty big deal. 
His son created the Levitical priesthood for all of, you know, throughout all the rest of history. However, he's making excuses already. They came to me and they said, you know, these people, you know them. They're, they're, they're mischievous. You know them. You know what they're like. I mean, what did you want me to do? I had, I had no choice. No, you had every choice. And you made the wrong choice. Following his own lusts, this guy. Because he's the one that told him to get gold. He's the one that told him what he was going to do. He's the one that came up with this whole idea of the golden calf. He cast it in the fire and there came out this calf as if it just blew, if it just jumped out. Like it, was, it had life in it. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Because they're like, we're not going to go through this again. Number one, did you forget what you just came through? Did you forget the Egyptians? Did you forget the, the sea parting? Did you forget that God descended upon a mountain in lightning and thundering and spoke and you heard it? The God of all the world And you forget? Who's on the Lord's side? Come unto me. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves, and he said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, go in and out from the gate to throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Eli did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of that people that day about 3,000 men. What a disaster. They just, Moses made a decision. He said, we will not have these, these retractors in our camp. These, de, de, these men who are defecting from the kingdom of God. And they must go. They must be eradicated. And they must die. And they didn't die miraculously. They died by the sword. God didn't just give them a plague and poof gone they were, these men, the sons of Levi, armed up, went to their homes and slayed them, and their families, I'm sure. So here we see Moses, he destroys these first tablets made by God, and God requires this unique effort by Moses because of his actions, which was to produce a second set of tablets, and this is what's interesting. This is a new effort. Moses had to create the second set of tablets. It had to become a joint work between God and us. Between God and Moses. He had to work together. You see, when, when the tablets came for free, it meant nothing. Moses didn't put any effort into it. Moses didn't work on it. Moses was just handed something and it meant nothing. If I give you my phone to throw across the room, you could do it. Because it didn't take you anything to get my phone. It didn't cost you anything. There's a concept in Judaism that discusses this paradoxical, paradoxical event in some detail. And, and, and there's value for us to understand that the human condition and our understanding of the events here that occur in our lives are directly connected together with God's desire for our spirit. Our condition to not see value in what's free is innate. We all have the problem. It's not something that's unique to you or unique to Moses or unique to the children of Israel or unique to anyone. We all have the same problem. And we all have the same struggle and we all have the same fight.
So I found this article, and it talks about how the author believes that the first set of commandments should have remained intact because there's, they're greater in their holiness. They should have remained intact because they were holy. They were touched by the finger of God. That's a basic premise. And then the, the less holy, they stayed whole. Why is it that the less holy stayed whole? The holy is destroyed and the less holy remains whole. Doesn't that sound a lot like what's been going on with, let's say, the man who died on the cross? The holy is destroyed and the unholy is remained in death. The parallel between the, the two sets of tablets, if you remember, John 1.1 1, 1 says, what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and Yeshua is this Word. We say it every Shabbat as a community, and the point being is at Har Sinai, standing on top of that mountain, when God was there as a theophany, any time the voice of God is audible, any time the voice of God is a voice in and of itself, that is Yeshua. He is the voice of God. He's the words of God. Those words were placed on that stone, and then man broke him. He was broken by us. The same thing. Yeshua is the same. Yeshua, the Word made flesh, was broken yet again, crucified for us, so that we might remain whole. He was even teaching Moses what he had to do in the future. He was even teaching Moses, not just the concept of Joseph or Abraham and Isaac, and where Isaac had this experience on the mountain with his father, where his father takes him up, binds him, right? Genesis chapter 12. Binds him up. No, 22. Genesis chapter 22. He binds him up. Goes to kill him. And we have this concept that, hey, look, it looks just like Jesus. And Jesus, God was showing Abraham that, you know, what he's going to have to do with his son. God showed Moses what he was going to have to do for the people. And the whole stays intact. We stay intact, the unholy. We stay intact because God is that gracious. He's that sufficient. He's that awesome. Jewish scholars distinguish between two types of divine human encounters. I've talked about this before. They call them, first of all, the awakening from above, and there's an awakening from below. There's two types of encounters that we have in life. The awakening from the above and the awakening from the, above, the below. The first is initiated by God and the second is initiated by man. Okay, which, which is what it sounds like. The awakening from above, it's spectacular. It's supernatural. It's an event that bursts through the chains of causality that at other times bind the natural world. An awakening from below, however, has no such grandeur. It's not supernatural. It's not this huge event. It's not turn on the TV and go to some Hillsong concert where everybody feels like they're falling out and they have this huge supernatural event and their healing's everywhere. That's not the awakening from below. That's not when somebody wakes up. That's an experience. That's a moment in time. You get goosebumps. You had this time where, oh man, look at everyone. Look what's happening here. Look at the movement of God. The supernatural's everywhere. And people try to recreate that and recreate that and recreate that. Does that change you? Did the Ten Commandments that God fingered upon the stone himself change Moses it 
It's a gesture that is human, this awakening from below. There's another difference between these awakenings. Other than the fact that one is supernatural and one is human, the awakening from above it can change nature. But it does not in and of itself change human nature. In it, no human effort has been expended. Those to whom it appears are passive. While it lasts, it's overwhelming, but only while it lasts. Thereafter, people revert to what they were. Invariably, once you have this supernatural experience with God, you revert back to what you were. You don't change. You change for a moment, you change for a second, but you don't change. This is the concept about many week this is the concept about when a believer comes to the faith, they are sold out to God and then slowly begin to normalize. Imagine, you know, you know, everyone that comes to the faith right away, they become they become very uh, sold out. They they, they be, what we call it zealous. They become zealots for the faith, zealots for God, and they want to go tell everybody. And they ended up they end up destroying their families. Right? They're, they go to their family and say, you're all sinners and you're all going to hell. Do you understand what you're, gonna, what you're doing? And, you know, especially people that come into Messianic Judaism. It's, absolute, it's, it's terrible. You've got to try to temper it down. Like, don't go into your family and say you're all going to burn in hell because you keep Christmas or you, keep, or you eat pork. I mean, that's not... You, relax. <laughs> relax. You're going to live this way for the rest of your life, hopefully. So let's... Pace yourself and understand what you're doing. Understand it. So that when you talk to people, it can make sense to them. What happens is, is if you're brand new to something and you start talking about it, it doesn't make sense to anybody. If you've been doing it and you've learned it and it becomes your essence, it makes sense to everybody. Everybody will understand it in your life, throughout your life. But many times the, changing, the change to believing in Yeshua comes as a result of a supernatural event where the new believer is passive and God is the aggressor. But after a while, they begin to live and realize nothing outside of that event has changed. So they typically settle back into their own skin again. So when you come to faith, a lot of times in the church, they tell you, hey, look, if you come to Jesus, he'll, 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 he'll protect you. He'll care for you. He'll take care of your pocketbook. He'll take care of your mortgage. Your family will be restored. Your, 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 your relationships will be restored. God will restore. Take what the devil has you know, stole from you, what the canker worm has eaten. All of these things that are said, the buzzwords in the churches that are said, they, they come to the faith and they're crying, and Lord, I need you. And they come to faith, and then a month later, and five months later, and a year later, and two years later, the mortgage is still broke, they can't pay the bills, their marriage is still corrupt, and, and all kinds of stuff is still going on. And they began to say, what was the point? Revert back to the way they were, and it's over. I can tell you, I know I sound like Mr. Debbie Downer, but I'm telling you, there is millions and millions of experiences like that. For every one experience that someone literally did have all those changes, which, is tr which can happen, don't get me wrong, I have faith to believe that, but you are, you are the reason why the change happens, FYI. God doesn't give it to you for free. He gives you a stone tablet and you have to write the commands in it. It's a joint work between God and you. God doesn't give you something for free. That's the moral of the story. For every one story that somebody did, it did work out for them when they came to the faith, there's a million of those stories where it didn't work out because they only experienced the awakening from above and did not include themselves in the process. You do have to do something. 
Reverend Schuler. Don't just sit there. Do something. That guy, I tell you what, I was seven years old, I think, when I first saw that commercial, and it still eats in my head. You do. You have to be a part of it. You, you think that God's just going to supernaturally change your life, your events? You're out of your mind. He didn't do it for the children of Israel. He didn't do it for Moses. This is a phenomenon that the children of Israel experienced while building the golden calf. Less than a month after, less than a month, le four weeks, they have a supernatural event that God appears on a mountain and he speaks to them. <coughs> Go tell it on the mountain. I mean, they're worshiping God around this mountain. It's a supernatural event. Everyone is, has got to feel goosebumps. Everyone has to feel the, the presence, right, that you hear about all the time in the church. The rhema. Everyone's got to have it. Because he's physically there. Talking and they hear him. You know how do you know that they hear him? Because he says, they said, all that you say, we hear and we will do. Right? So they hear him. Four weeks later, they're like, yeah, this guy's not coming down. He's, he's probably dead, you know. I don't know what happened to that guy. What does he do up there? Yeah, we just need a calf and we'll be good to go. Four weeks after a supernatural event, their life is not changed. There's nothing different. They're back to the way they were in Egypt. And why? Because it was free. They didn't have to take part in it. We have to take part in our relationship with God. And sometimes that means struggles in life. That's us taking part. And everybody's different. Everybody has a different problem. Everybody does. I mean, I was at work. <laughs> this isn't going to offend anyone, I hope, but I was at work and I was talking to somebody about, uh, you know, what I was going to eat. And apparently the person I was talking to was, like, frustrated with me because he was going through something. And he said, dude, you have white people problems. And I said, well, dude, you all right? Like, and that's the thing. Our problems are all different. Some of us may be good on this or that, but we all have them. But guess what I think? That's our Awakening from below. The only thing that can change you, really change you, is an awakening from below. Not the supernatural. And isn't that the craziest thing? This supernatural event, if God decided at this very moment to drop down from the sky and stand before us in the presence, in, in, our, in, it, in our presence, in the pillar of fire, and speak, we'd all remember it for a long time. But it would not change you. Four weeks later, you'd be the same person you were four weeks ago. That's proven time and time and again. The scriptures prove it. The scriptures prove it. That's not me making things up. That's not me making an assertion. That's not a hypothesis. That's not me saying, you know, this is my belief. It's literally proven. 
It's fact. What we realize from these points is that basically the events we experience in the supernatural seem to be powerful enough to overwhelm us in a moment and the days that follow, yet they don't necessarily leave a lasting impression that will innately change us from who we are. And many people argue that God has changed them supernaturally and that if it wasn't for the change God made them, them, they would never be in the place that they are. And that's a great story. That's a great, that's a great uh, testimony. I had a supernatural event, and if God never did that to me, I never would be the person I am. But guess what? When they go home, and they're sitting at the dinner table, they still sometimes get sad, and they get angry and they say they don't understand why this is happening or that's happening that supernatural event didn't change their life circumstances the awakening from below that is still something that's very much real and in Judaism we we would argue that it's not necessarily a supernatural event that changed you from being an unrighteous person that you that you were as much as it is the joint effort between you and God and let's try to understand that idea because you have to make a decision to be righteous God doesn't just make you righteous you have to do something it just doesn't happen. The awakening from below makes a permanent mark. A permanent mark on your life. We've taken the initiative. That's why it's permanent. Human beings <coughs> will take the initiative. Something in them changes. Their horizons of possibility have been expanded. They now... They now know that they're capable of great things because they did so once. They are aware that they can do so again. An awakening from above temporarily transforms the external world. An awakening from below permanently transforms our internal world. The first changes the universe. The sex, second changes us. The universe changes with God's and we change when it's from below. Two examples. The first, before and after the division of the Red Sea, the Israelites were confronted by enemies, before by the Egyptians, after by the Amalekites. The difference is total. Before the Red Sea, the Israelites were commanded to do nothing. Stand still and you will see the deliverance God will bring to you today. It was free. Totally, utterly free. At the Red Sea, stand still. You'll see the deliverance God will bring to you today. God will fight for you. You need only be still. That's what we want, right? We want that supernatural. Most people do. Most people want that. I just want to stand still. God will fight for you. Stand still. And I'll be honest, there are events that are universe events that are so big that guess what you'll have to do? Stand still. And God will fight for you. Will it change you? I hope. But let's see what really changes them. They're facing the Amalekites, and the Israelites had to do what? Fight themselves. God now is in standing for them. He solves this problem for you. Now you have to solve this problem for yourself. It's joint. You're both fighting, you're just fighting different battles. The first battle, it was impossible for them to overcome. The second battle, he goes to Moses. 
And he says, choose men and go out and fight the Amalekites. The first was an awakening from above. The second was an awakening from below. The difference here is palpable. Within three days after the division of the sea, the greatest of all miracles, the Israelites began complaining that there's no water and there's no food. Within three days after the Red Sea parting and taking out the Egyptians, there's no water, there's no food. But after war against the Amalekites, the Israelites never again complain when facing a conflict. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that after the war against the Amalekites that they fought themselves, they never complained about a conflict with the, with the people? The sole exception was when spies returned and the people lost heart and when they relied on hearsay testimony and not on the immediate prospect of the battle itself. That, that was the sole moment, but they still went in and they battled and they won. The moral of the story is that the battles fought for us do not change us. The battles we fight do change us. And more often than not, what you don't realize is you're fighting the battle with God. Sometimes you think that I'm standing still and letting God fight. The reality is you're fighting too and you don't know it. You're fighting to overcome a circumstance. You're fighting to overcome an, a, a feeling. You're fighting to overcome the people around you that are coming against you. You're fighting to overcome all kinds of things internally. You're trying to be righteous and not unrighteous. You're trying to maintain credibility. Whatever it may be, you're fighting every single day, and God's fighting for you too. It's a joint effort, and you'll win because you're doing it as a team. And not only do you win, you change because you fought. Literally, standing and doing nothing is doing exactly that. Put my hands in my pockets. I'm just going to hang out and wait. I got no reason to fight. I mean, you're not even engaged. I'm just going to hang out and wait. All right, the seas are parted. Let's go, guys. Come on. You walk. Yeah, they're running after us, but it's all right. And you walk. You're not doing anything. That's literally standing still. When you're engaged in the battle and nothing you say can actually change this problem, you have to wait on God for that, but you're still fighting inside. Okay, there's a fight that's changing you. And that's an important part. Most of us, if we're reasonable to think of our inner selves and we do a self-accounting on a regular basis, we would realize that most of what has made us who we are comes out of a direct response to what we have done or what we have experienced. That's who, what makes you who you are. Not what you receive. Not what you get for free. Everything my parents did for me growing up, they, cared, they took care of me. They took care of me like I didn't have to lift a finger, really. I went to work. My, I'd get a job. Literally, my paycheck, I'd spent the whole paycheck. Because I had my needs cared for. I didn't have to have a say. I just looked like the man. I'm like an 18-year-old with a wad of cash blowing a wad of... I looked like I was the man because I could do that because I was cared for. But that didn't make me who I am. You know what made me who I am is when I was married, had to take care of my family, lost my job, and had zero dollars and zero cents. And I had to figure out what to do. Zero dollars and zero cents had to feed my kids. And had to feed my kid, Eliana, and my wife. I had to figure things out. My experiences after that, the things that I went out and fought for, that changes you. That makes you different. Things aren't handouts. Life isn't free. You have 
have to learn differently. You have to learn for yourself. You don't care about it when it's not given to you. You know, when my dad bought me a car when I was 16 years old, it was a great car. It was my first car. And then he bought me a, one when I was 19 years old. It was a truck. He bought me a new truck. I had a great new truck. And then I didn't understand the value of those vehicles until I had to get my own. You can't change when something's free to you. Now, if I didn't have the life that I had growing up, I'd be really mad at my parents. <laughs> you know, because I had a good one and I enjoyed it. I was able to enjoy myself. And then I was able to learn. It's the same thing. That's the fight that we constantly have to battle to change ourselves. If we don't change, we can't expect God just to pour out on us and make us change. It, we always say, Lord, make me different. Lord, give, give me what you need of me. What do you require of me, Lord? Stephen was preaching, I think it was last week. He preached last week, right? And in his teaching... He was making some comments about leaders and pastors and stuff. And I looked at my mom and I said, you know, about people who ask the question. People who ask the question, Lord, what do you require of me? I just want to serve you. Help me serve you. Help me serve you better. Bring me into, my, into your calling. What have you called me to do into service? I looked at my mom and I said, why don't people just get up and go do something? If you're doing something righteous, God intends for that to be done. Like, that's a good thing. We sit back and wait for God to give us our calling. I just want to know what my purpose is. What's my purpose in this world? What has God called me to? I mean, that conversation, frankly, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, is, is old. You know what you can do? You can pick up a shovel and get to work. Go do something for the kingdom of God. Just figure it out. Someone needs help, help them. If you know someone in the community or in your friendship or in your family needs help, maybe God would say, go get in your car and go help them. We sit in our sofas, watching our televisions goes, oh man, that's terrible what happens to what happened to so and so. I wonder what they're gonna do. And when we go to bed and when we lay our head down on the pillow, Lord, just show me your calling for me. Help me to serve you. Come on, go serve the person that needs help. Do something. It's that simple. But we have a vision in our heads of what a calling is. It's this leadership role of, of, of you know, everyone's looking at us as something, you know, and we're being applauded. I mean, I don't even, I was telling the guys earlier this week, I don't even like being called a rabbi. I, I don't, I, I don't, all I have is the ability to put a thought together and I'm not afraid to talk in front of people. Those are the two things. I can put a thought together and, I, and I'm okay with talking in front of you. And I feel like God has given me a voice for something. So I stand up here and I share what God tells me. I don't need recognition. I don't need you to call me a rabbi. I don't need anyone to call me anything. I just want to do whatever I can do to help. That's how you should be. That's how we all should be. We should just want to do what we can do for God to help wherever. Within, within the limits of the rules of God. Right? Knowing that there's people that will take advantage and not get taken advantage of. Teach people how to fish and cook. Lead people to water and show them how to drink it. In the New Testament, there's hundreds of examples for us to read that address this joint effort between us and God and our relationship with Him. And the reality of experiencing real life on, on our own to understand God's purpose and relationship with us. The one I chose for today was that of Peter walking on water. It says straight away Yeshua constrained His disciples to get into a ship, to go before Him unto the other side, and while He set 
sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up un into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Yeshua went out to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they troubled, saying, It, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear, but straightway Yeshua spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it's I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out to you on the water. Now all of a sudden, this is a joint experience. This is now coming from an awakening from above experience to an awakening from below experience. It's joint, because Peter asks for it. So Yeshua says to him, Come on out. Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Yeshua. But when he saw the wind, bo the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Yeshua stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little faith, wherefore did you doubt? Because think about it. He says, come to him. He steps out of the boat and he's walking. He's actually walking on it. And then he sees the wind blowing and the waves going. And he gets scared and he begins to sink. And he says, Lord, save me. And Yeshua probably chuckled a bit and said, hey, you little doubt. Why did you do that? What was doubtful? And the reason he probably chuckled a bit was because the dude was literally walking on water. He was doing it. It's like us with our kids. We're standing behind them. We're teaching them how to ride a bicycle. You're holding the bicycle seat. And they're like, okay, Dad, I'm going, I'm going. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you got my seat? Yeah, I got your seat. All right. I'm, you know, you still got my seat? Yeah, I got your seat. All right, Dad, you got my seat? Yeah, I got your seat. I don't have a seat. All right, you have my seat? Yeah, I got your seat. They look back, they see I'm not there. All of a sudden, what do they do? Every single time. They're doing it. They're killing it. <coughs> they're walking on water. And then the wind's blowing. I don't got the seat. And they fall every time. It's unbelievable. This is the story of, of Peter walking on water. It's no different. We live it with our own children. But this is also the story of doing it together. The joint handiwork between man and God. I can't be who I can be without you, Lord. But I can't, I can't be who I'm supposed to be without being having my part in this process. I have to do the work too. We always use this example of not having faith in God, attempting to encourage the body to ignore the waves and the storms of life because God's in control. I can hear it right now. It's always the, you know, the world around you can be stormy and, you know, it could cause you to want to fall. You know, that's the, the typical message. But today, the question is, do we seriously think or expect that Peter would have re reacted any other way? be shaken. It's his first physical encounter with the spiritual in that way. It's his very first encounter with the spiritual in a, in a, in a supernatural way that way. This was Peter's first experience where the awakening from above merged with the awakening from below and he was truly changed. He lacked faith because he didn't yet know what he was capable of with God. And I'm also sure that he probably never tried that again, but was encouraged because he now knew to trust in Yeshua in a new way. You see, even though they experienced the feeding of the 5,000 prior to this, that was simply awakening from above. The feeding of the 5,000 was an awakening from above. It wouldn't have changed them. That was in a supernatural event. In fact, if he would have thought about that after this event, he goes out on the water, he's like, 
look, dude, you took a couple fishies and loaves and you turned it into food for 5,000 people. I'm pretty sure if you tell me to come walk on the water that I'm going to be good to go. He, he wasn't because it was an awakening from above. He wasn't involved. It was free. So now he's involved and he's changed. Peter's nature changed when he merged his own awakening with God's. This is the only way that he was able to come, become what we call the rock. He was not able to become what God required of him until he experienced for himself the changing power of personal experience. He had to be a part of that. That's the only way you can become who God requires you to become. One does not know the joys of success until you experience it. And these two extremes drive us to change. Once we're defeated, we can only rise if we know that we've succeeded before. There are many that have not been directed on the path to successes and thus remain in defeat their whole lives. And we have the opportunity through the Word of God to enjoy a life of peace and success through following His commands. Yet until we act them out and be as Moses on the mountain, carving them for ourselves, we will not fully understand their grace and the destruction of the first tablets represents the failure of the first Adam and the creation of the second set of tablets represents the requirement of the awakening from above, merging, merging with the awakening from below, requiring God and man to work together, evidenced in the birth of the Son of Yeshua, the Son of God, or the second tablets. We have to be, we have to understand that if we're not engaged in our relationship with God, and if we're not taking all of the, the, the experiences that we go through in life, and looking at them as God's plan. We will never be fully used by God. Every experience is God's plan. So that we can be fully used by God. And let's not be like the children of Israel that experience God and then flippantly run away from Him. I mean... It's our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands, and not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs, and our lot like all their multitude. We bend the knee and bow, and acknowledge our thanks before the King of kings. The Holy One, blessed is he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation, the seat of his glory is in the heavens above presence of his powers in the most exalted heights he's our God there's none other true is our king there's nothing beside him as it is written in his Torah you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below there is none other Amen. Let's stand together.